record is set up. All right. Once you sit down, you can then move. <laughs> Sorry, I yeah, it's okay. Down there, down there yeah. All right. So for the people at home, uh, we had. Uh, I think as Geshla said, we had some um, prayer session on behalf of Poonam's mom who passed away 49 days ago. Then we have um, offered lunch that they offered. So it was finished, I think, an hour ago, or maybe most of it was finished probably half an hour ago. Um, so I went home an hour ago and tried to make quick preparations. So it was a bit haphazard and all over the place. Let's see what comes out of it. So um, I had a ch the chance to do to prepare only one offense, secondary offense for this session. So let's look at the tenth one and then go back to um, the text and cover a few points that I was looking at yesterday and today. But before we do that, have you got any questions? Yeah, I have a question about, in that outline, mm. as we're going through, it uses the word aspiration, and then when we're going through the process, it uses the word dedication. So aspiring for, and it says in the verses, um, the headings, like in the mm. um, translation, we have the same dedication. So I was just wondering, uh, you know, because we can think differently if we're using the word aspiring or dedication, like yeah. Can have a so, um, so first of all, um, all right, so we have here this edition of the outline, and it uses the word aspiring, and this is a translation of Gesed mm -hmm. commentary. So, this is a I think a correct translation. So, let's look at the other text that we're using and see. So you said that here we have dedicate, dedicating it, yeah. right? Yeah, so, yeah, it's all dedicating. So actually to be, to be more precise, it should be sparring rather than dedicating it. But the thing is that um, although Geza Damalinchen created this outline and he called it aspiring, still when we looked at um, the difference between aspiring and dedicating, we said that to dedicate something, you need to dedicate a certain substance. Yeah. If you don't have a substance that you use, then what you say is a, what you do is an aspiration. Yeah. So here we're looking at a section in which you dedicate your body, speech, and mind. So although Gesa Damanichin calls it aspiration, it's actually dedication. So, mm -hmm. you know, you've got your substance. Yeah, because you've got your substance. You hear you offer particularly your, your body possessions and roots of virtue. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, all right, so let's look at the 10th secondary offense. So the 10th one says, if a Bodhisattva trains in conformity to hear where he or she need not it is a secondary offense of doing little for the benefit of beings. Such acts include prescriptions related to keeping and abandoning Vinaya clothing for 10 days. Prescriptions means formulated rules, right? So I'm not totally clear what those formulated rules are with respect to keeping or discarding clothing for 10 days, but it seems that basically when I looked at our commentaries, um, it is getting our priorities, not getting our priorities as Mahayana practitioners. So on one hand, we have, um, it's particularly, let's, let's say for monks and nuns. So we have our vow, ordination vow, which is a Hinayana vow that has certain rules in. It. But then we take upon ourselves the Bodhisattva vow and the main aspiration, the body of the aspiration that we develop is to, to be of benefit to others. So in certain situations, you have to look at 
what you cannot do it as a monastic versus what will be the purpose of doing it nonetheless if it serves to great benefit of many other beings. Now here, of course, it needs to be something that is trivial. Um, I guess that most of us will not have to experience that decision in our life in which we will have to um, keep, you know, kill another human being in order to protect the lives of many. You know, you can look at that as a hypothetical question or taking what was not given to you or, you know, I think that... But I think uh, taking what's not given to you is a much more subtle one. Yeah. It could be anything growing in the garden, it could be, you know, doing these things. Mm. Yeah, but what I mean is that we're probably not going to encounter a situation where we will have to take something that oh, was not given to us because. in order to benefit a great number of sentient beings. I mean, you can think of situations like that, but, you know, it needs to be, you know, taking what was not given to you, basically, it's breaking your vow. You know, it's not that you can say that, because I use it for the benefit of others, it doesn't count as breaking my vow. You know, if you take what was not, what was not given to you, it will come at expense at expense of your vow, right? So, if there is a kind of hypothetical scenario where it would be such a massive benefit to sentient beings, you can consider that. But probably in our life, we're not going to encounter such yeah, a situation. Same situation when you find something to. Oh, she's an actual one. Yeah, when I was a wildlife carer, yeah. we were going to parks. Yeah. And you're not allowed to take vegetation to parks, but we used to go into the parks and cut leaves to feed to the possums that we were raising in here. Um, parks, they would just turn a blind eye, like they just hoped they never ran into us because they didn't really want to stop us. But at the same time, it wasn't really legal. But we used to just, I mean, we didn't destroy the plant, we just, well, taking what was not given to you it needs to be, first of all, something that is owned by a certain person, or you can say by a community. You know, because you can say that even even if there is no one individual that is the owner, it can belong to a community. That's one criteria. Another thing is that it needs to be of a certain monetary value. So you now, if you say if you take, um, if you break the law and you cut branches in national park, this is an offense that is against the rules of a certain country and it does incur certain, we do incur a certain fault with respect to the vow, but I think that one would argue that since you cannot really put a monetary value to it, then it's not, it doesn't constitute taking what was not given to you is stealing. I mean, it's still kind of breaking the, the law. I think that, you know, also when you think of um, creating a rift in the Sangha, you know, it's like, will we create a rift in, another thing that would cause us to lose our ordination vow, will we experience this really great catastrophe where we would have to create a rift in the Sangha in order to protect the lives of many beings? You know, it's very unlikely that something like that would happen. Mm -hmm. Definitely with um, avoiding sexual relationship. You no, know, it's not that for the sake of all sentient beings, I'm not going to have sex. You know, it doesn't make sense. You know, I'm going to put my life on the line here. I'm going to have yeah, sex in order to protect the lives of many. No, it, does, it, it doesn't really, it's not going to happen. I'm not saying it's an ordinary moment. Yeah. I'm saying the some high realized being who sees the need to have a child for the benefit of the world. I think that would be a different scenario that could happen. I'm not saying. Yeah. Well, the last two people. Well, it's about, about that we need this being to come into existence. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> well, it is likely that it's not going to happen to me. I think that probably great beings can, can come to the world without my help. <laughs> so, um, um, so Paul is saying whether we experience a negative result from these actions will depend upon the motivation. Is that right? So, you know, sometimes they say that in performing a certain um a certain negative action of course the motivation plays a big part of it so i think that the um textbook example that almost always come comes up in teaching is about that um evil person that was sailing 
on a ship that had on board 500 people or 999 people, there are different numbers, different details. He saw that one person was such, I'm sorry, there was one Bodhisattva on board. He saw that there was an evil person who was about to kill everyone else on board. And in order to save everyone else, he killed that, um, that evil person. So, I mean, of course, you can find many loopholes in that story. <laughs> I mean, like who has the ability to kill 500 people? I mean, it sounds like a um, fictional poison. story. Yeah, yeah poison. Anyway, it seems that kind of, the stories, the stories can be just stories to tell a certain, le to tell a certain lesson. So, um, anyway, so the sun does say that kind of, of course, the motivation here would, uh, was compassion to protect the life of all the others, to protect also the, the karma of that evil person that was about to kill all the others. So the Bodhisattva decided to kill that evil person. So he created a positive action, motivated by compassion, but he also created negative action because he had to kill that person. So there are two actions here. It's not that there is only one action. You can say that there are two. Um, and it is said that because he was greatly motivated by compassion, the negative action turned to be a, a slight negative action. But it was still a negative action that results in suffering. Um, so, sorry? What happened? Well, I hope, that he, I hope that he lived happily ever after. But no, it's, yeah. Well, someone said that kind of he would, was born in the invisible realm, but kind of just like, um, just yeah, just like a ball bouncing back, it bounced back to. I mean, I don't know. It's a story. I don't, I'm not sure that it's a true story. So, Paul says whether we experience a negative result, then he says the explanation differs with that story about whether the negative result is experienced. But regardless, the Bodhisattva should accept the suffering result for the benefit of others. Yeah, they do. You know, so the Bodhisattva thought, in that story, the Bodhisattva thought that I rather experienced the result of killing another um, living beings rather than that person experiencing the result of killing 500 people. So the Bodhisattva in that story took upon himself um, the suffering of killing another beings in order to protect the other person. So that's one of the more moral stories or the moral values of this story. I don't know, kind of, I, I, yeah, I haven't heard it like that, but I think that there are so many different versions of this story, so, yeah. So why did we, why did we speak about it? Okay, we spoke about it in relation, we started speaking about it in relation to 10. If a Bodhisattva trains in conformity to here where he or she need not, it is a secondary offense of doing little for the benefit of others, for the benefit of beings. So I started saying that it is likely to not regard the vital things in relation to the vow. It is more of a secondary thing. Like, for example, um, if you are really strict with the Vinaya, if, for example, if you do it in a way that some Hinayana places do, then you don't touch money, you know, right? So if you look at, for example, the way that Ajahn Brahm trains, but they touch chicks. Mm, they touch, they touch okay. chicks. But anyway, you know, there could be a situation where you could say that from the point of view of certain Vinaya tradition, you cannot touch money. From the point of view of benefiting a great number of beings, it might be that you will have to touch money. So you have to sort out your priorities, right? Which is like the smaller purpose, which is the bigger purpose. And you might decide to even to incur the fault of touching money in order to benefit a vast number of beings. You know? So you can, we can think of certain scenarios like that. Or in some, for example, some Hinayana countries, it is considered to be a grave fault if um, a woman touches a monk, you know, just even in passing. I remember that um, a few years ago, I was flying from India back to Australia and I was with my teacher. We stopped in Thailand for four days of holidays in Bangkok. And we were taking the sky train. Both of us were, were wearing robes. And as soon as we sat down 
all the other women <laughs> stood up and left like we were, you know, we were pariahs, like we were diseased. I mean, of course, no, of course, this is joking. You know, they, they really take it seriously. A woman should not um, touch monks. So, you know, suppose that you follow those rules in a very strict way, but still you come across a scenario where you have to pull someone, someone out of, a raging water, of raging water. Or, you know, you have to protect, in order to protect a great number of beings, in order to work for them, you have to reach out for someone. You know, so in that sense, if you think that I cannot do that because it violates my Hinayana trainings or my monastic vow, and you don't benefit others, this is the secondary fault, right? So basically, we can think of those, I think, hypothetical scenarios, or sometimes it's like you would think, how would such a scenario would come up? But we do, I think that in, sometimes we are presented with situations where you need to think of the great benefit or the prohibition. I mean, one thing that does come to mind, for example, is as monastics, at, at least I think that as fully ordained monk, I'm not allowed to light fires, to dig trenches, to cut down trees, um, branches, grass, and so forth. But still, you know, we have to be sometimes sensible about it. Like, for example, you have to help someone doing a fire puja. It'd be great if someone else gets the material, you know. So we need sometimes yamshin, those small sticks for the fire puja. You need the segmented grass. If there's no one else to do it, I mean, if there's no one else that could possibly do it, could you say that, sorry, I'm not helping you because... Um, I cannot do it, I'm a monk. But then you have to look at it. Why are you setting up the It's to not harm beings. Like yeah. Very yeah, the, the whole purpose is not to harm being. But, you know, I said that the point that I brought up is just to say that there are certain situations where you have to decide what you're going to do, you know. So if there is a greater purpose, then, and you know that kind of there are certain things that you shouldn't do, you need to sort out your priorities to decide where you do it. And, of course, you don't dismiss your vow and think that it's not a big deal. You still confess and purify whatever faults you have incurred with respect to your vow. But this is the gist of, I think that this is the gist of this secondary offense, when you kind of not sort out your priorities well and you relinquish the benefit of others, where you just kind of maintain a more of self-concerned, I think, uh, attitude. Is that clear? All right, so let's look at the outline. Training in the mind that gives away body material wealth and roots of virtue. So this is a part of training in the perfection of generosity. So as I think that is we, sorry, I didn't put it, I didn't put it on the screen. So training in a mind that gives away material wealth, uh, your body, material wealth and roots of virtue is part of training in the perfection of generosity. Um, and as we said yesterday, there is no separate chapter in Shantideva's text that explains the perfection of generosity. It comes up in this section and it will come up later on in other sections, particularly when you look at the, dedica the dedication chapter, there are quite a lot of verses in which, again, you can train in um, the thought of transforming your body possessions and roots of virtue into different things. But also in this very chapter, after, verse, after the verses to deal with, after verses 23 and 24, we have the um, concluding actions in which you make quite a lot of dedication prayers for the sake of others. Um, so this is also something that you could consider as a practice of generosity. So, um, I wanted to go back to um, what we said yesterday with respect to generosity, just to make sure that we all hold on to some bits of it. So, first of all, a general way of describing generosity is the intention to give. Uh, generosity in the shortest Explanation, it is the intention to give, the thought of giving. Here it says that it, is, it includes also the actions of body and speech that it motivates. 
there are three types of generosity, material generosity, generosity of giving the Dhamma, and generosity of giving fearlessness. Then completing the perfection of generosity, this is from the Lama in general. Completing the perfection of generosity is not contingent on eliminating all the poverty of sentient beings. There's one verse in Shantideva's text that says, that refers to that. It doesn't mean that being generous means that there will no longer be hunger and poverty in the world because if that would be the meaning of being generous, that poverty, hunger, and so forth would be completely eliminated, no one would be able to perfect generosity. Buddhas and Bodhisattvas would not be able to perfect generosity. And we know that that's not the case. They have perfected generosity or they are perfecting it. So to perfect generosity means um, it is increasing the intention to give to the point in which you have destroyed your stingy clinging to all that you own, your body, resources, and roots of virtue. And you completely conditioned your mind to giving them away to living beings from the depth of your heart. And not only that, but also to give in to others the effects of giving as well. Right, so there are a few features here that Lama Tsongkhapa mentions with respect to giving. So it is increasing the intention to give. That's one point. Second is that destroying is stinging clinging to everything that you own, your body possessions and roots of virtue. And the third feature, which is not different, but it's kind of, I think that it's more emphasizing this point, you completely condition your mind to giving them way to living beings from the depth of your heart, including the effects of giving as well. So we know that from giving, you receive resources, right? That's what he said with respect to giving. From generosity, you experience resources. So not only you're committed to giving away to sentient beings, you're also committed to giving away to sentient beings from the bottom of your heart, all the positive results that you will experience from giving. So normally we say that you sh we wanna give away to others without any sense of loss. So you can think of not only any sense of loss with respect to what you have now, but also any sense of loss with respect to what you will experience in the future from giving. Even though you might be having troubles or whatever, yeah. there are always other people who are as well off as you. And, you know, give from your heart, you know, to, to, to give them whatever you have to, to, to help us make things a bit easier for them. Yeah. But that's, well, that's from your heart. Yeah, from your heart. But also, you know, people can be not well off in different ways. Mm -hmm. You know, someone can be, of course, not well off financially, but it could also be not well off spiritually. You know, they might be financially totally awesome, totally in a good, good, you know, good conditions. But still either spiritually or just emotionally, they might be impoverished or experience difficulty. So you know, giving other, others from the depth of our heart, whatever we can give, other material things, but also advice, a good word, just to give them a smile. You know, that all those different things could be tokens of generosity towards others. So other things that I wanted to include with respect to generosity be before we delve into generosity of giving your body possessions and roots of virtue is to just draw a few verses from Chandrakirti's supplement to the middle way. Um, Matt spoke about it yesterday and I thought, I'd, yeah, maybe it's nice just to mention a few verses. I don't think that is honest is gonna mention them um, next week. Is it next week? Yes, yeah. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Yeah, the week, yeah. Um, I think that it is likely that his honest will focus on the sixth chapter from Chandukita's supplement, um, whereas the perfection of generosity is taught in the first one. Um, so, but still, there are a couple of 
couple of points, I think, that are nice to look at. Let's see where it is. Mm -hmm. The generosity, generosity of Dharma, generosity of materialness. Yeah. Material generosity. Material. Yeah, material generosity. So material generosity is giving things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so I was thinking about this last night, and I thought, you know, a, a form of generosity is um, active listening. A form of generosity is active listening. Active listening, okay. And that would be like, that, that would fit into the fearlessness. Fearlessness. When you say active listening, what do you mean? Well, you know, somebody's quite distressed and I'm upset, and, and you just listen to them mm. actively. Okay. So <laughs> um, I think that, yeah, you know, you, you can, um, I think that that's um, part of, I guess, generosity of giving fearlessness, you know, it's... Um, well, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. That, that, you know, I was talking about yesterday with that speech, generosity of speech, but also that in a speech, it's everybody has generosity, also having feedback. Um, I think that, you know, when you, you give a, there's someone in a distressed state of mind. Now we do encounter people sometimes who come to the center in a difficult space, but I think that also outside, I mean, particularly now the world is experiencing such great um, difficulties around COVID-19. You know, no one knows how things are going to fare. You know, we spoke about it, I think, yesterday. So, you know, if you can give someone just a new perspective or just listen to them or just give them a hug, you know, it's, you can put all of that under the umbrella of generosity of giving fearlessness, protection from fear. So Onyx um, says, is a Buddhist lay person accepting gifts from others and not refusing shows gratitude and respect. However, if we do not need these materials, may, may, may we give them away after receiving them? Yeah, it's actually, it's a good thing. Um, one interesting thing with making offerings to lamas is that kind of, sometimes you think that, um, you really want to offer something that is really dear to your heart and really special to the Lama that you really like. So kind of, it might cost you also a lot of money. It might be something that is really valuable and, you know, in your heart, you find it really difficult to part from it. But I think that if I have something precious, this is what I'm going to offer. So you make, you offer it to the Lama, he takes it and then he gives it away to the next person in line. I know maybe a few people have encountered that before. I've encountered that before. And you think kind of sometimes you think that, well, I might not have just given it away. You know, they just give it away to someone. What's the point in that? Well, the, the idea is that you give something to another person. It's no longer yours. It's no longer yours. The recipient of what was given can do with it whatever they want. And if they choose to give it to another person as a token of generosity, actually you should rejoice in that. So similarly, if someone gives us a present, you know, and we don't have anything to do, we don't have anything that can be done with it, actually we do need to give it to others. And this is what Lama Tsongkhapa also says when he speaks about um, the perfection of generosity. I think that it's in the perfection of generosity, I'm not sure, but in the Lama Nchamo it says that you receive something, then you should not think that I've received it for myself, I'm gonna keep it to myself. Mm -hmm. You need to think that I'm keeping it in store and I'm waiting for an opportunity to give it away to others. Now, when an opportunity to give it away to others will present itself to me, I will gladly give it away. You know, so it is a type of attitude that we develop, again, in order to destroy that stingy clinging that to things that we have. So. Um, for example, as monastics, you know, I think that many, many of you at home are not monks and nuns, so you know, sometimes the examples that I give might not be too relevant, but you know, as monastics, for example, we can keep two sets of robes traditionally, but normally we end up in having more than that. 
I think I'll tell you the story that you know, I went to India I, um, for ordination. So I bought two sets of robes. I thought myself, I'm going to be like a real good monk <laughs> with good rules, bought only two sets of robes, yeah. came back to Australia. Then Lama Soparambucha was at Bendigo. You know, and he heard that I became ordained, so he sent me a set of robes. <laughs> Geshe Chastering sent me a set of robes from India. My teacher from Taiwan sent me two sets of robes. Yeah. Geshe Jamin gave me two sets of robes. <laughs> then I went, a few months after that, I went to Tibet to, and I stayed with my teacher's family. They gave me this, this set of robes. <laughs> so I ended up being the Imelda Marcus of the robes. You know? <laughs> So, you know, when you... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So when I came back from my organization to Sydney, I also came back with a bag full of robes that I was happy. You know, I had yeah. more than when I arrived. But then one of my teachers saw me and said, oh, I'm going to offer you some robes. And I said, oh, I don't need. And I actually got a teaching from the teacher, you know, you know are you um, depriving me of the merit of <laughs> So actually this is maybe, that might be an example of yeah. the secondary, you no, know, avoiding the secondary offense number 10, you know. Yeah. You, should two, you should keep two sets of robes, yeah. but someone gives you yeah. a set of robes. You know, you accept it, they've created merit. But then you need to think about it as, um, this is the advice that we got before that, you now have more than you need. So you keep it in storage till, a person comes and they need it, you will gladly give them away without any sense of loss, right? So yeah. the way that you, you think about it is that it's not mine. I'm just keeping it in yeah. storage, waiting for an opportunity to give it away to others. Also, as, as said the other day, don't give it too long. Think it's no, give it yeah. 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 I mean, unfortunately, I have to say, it, honestly, it's not, I have the sets, sets of robes that I like and sets of robes that I don't like. I mean, don't like in a sense that they always end up at the bottom of the list. Yeah. So unfortunately, I'm more ready to give the ones at the bottom of the list rather than the ones on top of the list. <laughs> We're all I don't know. Progress. Yeah. <laughs> Confession. <laughs> give it away to someone. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> Anyway, so yeah, so, so the, the attitude is that um, I think that when you receive something and you don't, you don't need it, you can give it away. Of course, you know, if you know that the other person would be offended, then you need to do it skillfully, with a tap, not just kind of chuck it out. Now, what I try to do now with giving friends, presents to friends, I have friends that actually have so much stuff at home, then I try to think of what can I give others that doesn't really have less environmental impact, you know, rather than producing another thing, wasting another thing. Um, what can be given that would be more meaningful, but also has lesser impact? Cardboard box for their storage. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Build them a box for storage. <laughs> hmm. All right. So, <laughs> so in Chandakiti's supplement to the Middle Way, um, the first chapter, the beginning of the first chapter is teaching in general the presentation of the grounds. Um, and then from verse 9, it starts speaking of the perfection of generosity. So verse 9 says, then for him, which means Bodhisattva on the first ground, um, the first cause of perfect enlightenment giving becomes surpassing. That's on the first ground. His devotion to giving even his own flesh is reason for in, inferring the unimaginable that that not suitable to appear. Anyway, the first, on the first ground, the perfection of giving becomes greatly surpassing for that first ground Bodhisattva. It becomes a, a supramundane perfection. Now, on that ground, they are able to practice it by giving away their own body and external belonging, such as even the slightest, such that even the slightest attachment does not arise. So, 
On the first ground, the Bodhisattva has an ability to practically give away their own body. So we spoke so far in Shantideva's text about, gener about practicing generosity of giving away one's own body possessions and goods of virtue. So Lama Tsongkhapa said in, says in um, his Lama Nchemo that until you get to the point where you could give it before, sorry, before you get to the point where you can give it away without any sense of loss, without that sense of stingy and clinging, you're not allowed to give it in a practical sense. You have to still train your mind. When you get to the point where you can give away your body, like handing off over a piece of vegetable, this is when you're allowed to give away your body, right? So now we can come up with those different questions about what if I see this situation and um, I have to you know, surrender myself to do something even at the cost of my life and so forth. Yeah, we, know we could experience those situations, but if you think of generosity of giving away your own body and when would be the right time to practice it, it would be at a time in which you could give it away to others, just like giving a piece of vegetable without any sense of concern for yourself, completely motivated by love and compassion to others. So am I in that stage yet? I'm not there yet. So currently I'm still training my mind. I was just thinking that one of, of, of that advice in relation to if you see a situation where either you take the bullet or someone else does, like you jump in the gun, like would that be, that would be contrary to the advice because your life might be more beneficial. Hmm. Yeah. Translated yeah. to I mean, think of, for example, I mean, it's like it's sometimes easy to visualize those surreal and um, hypothetical situations. <laughs> but you know, suppose I, you know, it's honest that Lama is bringing such an immense benefit to the world, mm -hmm. you know. So, and I think that his attitude of compassion is such that. Uh, if he has to take the bullet for someone, he would do it gladly. But I think that also he would have the great wisdom that thinks that actually it's better to stay alive and be of benefit to others rather than one, the life of one person being taken away, you know? So anyway, in page, in the second volume of the Lama in Chamo, in page 119, Lama Tsongkhapa says, at present, as your determination has not matured and is weak, you do not actually give away flesh, etc., though you have already mentally given your body to all beings. According to the Companion of Training, which is another text that Shantideva composed, however, if you do not train in the thought of giving away your body in life, you will not become accustomed to it and so will remain incapable of giving away your body in life. Therefore, from now on, cultivate this thought. So this is where we start, right? Now we only train in thought. We don't do it, we don't cut pieces of our own flesh now um, in order to give it to others. We don't do it before we're thoroughly accustomed to it. Of course, you can think of, for example, donating a kidney to someone else and so forth. You know, if there is a situation actually where you can benefit others and it doesn't really, it doesn't mean that you will die. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, maybe to train in the perfection of generosity, give away vegetables, and you just have to give away your own body, like a person. Yeah, yeah, organ donation. You know, so if you can give away, for example, sorry. Yeah, yeah, donate, donating blood, donating kidney, hair, fingernails. Anyway, so. I mean, it's one thing to have the aspiration. Yeah. But, you know, the, the, the practice, like the style of practice, internal practice, that does sort of more attention to that practice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're visualizing cutting your body away and giving it away, that's true. But also, one thing that I wanted to do today, and I hope that we'll get to it, is to look at mind training like the rays of the sun, which oh explains in such a beautiful way how to practice giving away your own body.
um, from a social perspective. So actually, maybe maybe do, let's do it now. Um, actually, I'm just having a thought. It's not my body. Uh, I'm having a thought. Your body, or you know, grasping at my body. Mm-hmm. Well, Shantideva says in his verse that you should give it away to others and think that it doesn't belong to me. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, kind of you, and we've also encountered that attitude before. So we've offered a body to Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. So it is no longer ours to perform virtuous activities. Since we've offered a body, sorry, it is no longer ours to perform negative actions. So if we gave it to Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, if we offered a body to Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, we should do as we are told and do well with our body speech in mind. But also when we think of offering a body to sentient beings for the service of sentient beings, then when you think of practicing and giving away your body, you think, you think that actually I've already given it away to others when I committed myself to work for the sake of others, and therefore it's no longer mine to, do, to use it only for my own sake. So in giving away our own body in mantraing like the rays of the sun. It is found in the section of cultivating the conventional awakening mind. Um, And it is part of the meditation on giving and taking and tongue meditation. So seven point, this mind training like the rays of the sun is a commentary to the seven point mind training. By um, Chekawa. Yeah, Chekawa was the one who composed the seven point mind training. So in this text, it says, um, in the seven point mind training is, we have an instruction on practicing combination of giving and taking. So I think that we spoke about it yesterday. The whole meditation of giving and taking in Tonglen meditation comes up as a supplement, supplementary, 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 supplementary topic of the um, equalizing and exchanging self with others. So you've done the exchange and now in order to make your love and compassion to others greater, you practice giving and taking. So in the seventh point mind training, it says in this text in page 59, practice a combination of giving and taking. That's from the seven point mind training. So I have it here on my Kindle app. Why is it so big? Yeah. All right. Yeah, that's that's a little bit extreme. Maybe bigger. For the visually impaired. Is that good? You reckon? Yeah. All right. All right, so let's see where it begins. So practice combination of giving and taking is a line taken from the seven point mind training. So there is, that's the part of the meditation on love. And then it begins with, if you then go to page, um, 61 in the book, we have the section of how to dispense your body possessions and virtues in general. It says, now follow a general explanation. Oh, put it on the screen for you guys, sorry. So how to dispense your body possessions and virtues in general. Now follow a general presentation according to the scriptures of just how we give away body possessions and virtues. The purpose of giving them away is that so in so doing, we will complete the two collections of merit and wisdom. And this is the reason we should give them away. It quotes from Shantideva's text, and this is a verse that we've covered, I think, yesterday. I will give away without restriction or without regret my body possessions and the virtues I have produced in the three times to accomplish the welfare of all beings. 
For among these, it is generally inappropriate to give away the body because it consists of unclean substances such as flesh and blood. For those who are eager, the way to do this is explained below. If the body is to be given away, the array of Chang Sutra says, you should transform yourself into a wish-fulfilling body that sustains all wandering beings. Also, the Sutra of the Vajra Victory banner says, just as though through various means and through various manifestations, the four great elements sustain all beings, the Bodhisattva transforms his own body so that it is the basis for sustaining all sentient beings. This is actually the very stuff we've covered today. And this is the verse that Geshla concluded with today. So that before tomorrow, it's good to think about this verse again and again, to think of how we um going to, um, be committed to work, to supporting and sustaining sentient being just like the four elements and space sustain the world. Um, yeah, it relates to the four immeasurables and the immeasurable love and in what we have in our, our um, meditation on Tom Lin, it's a, you know, on the giving side, Transforming your body into a wish granting tool that gives every sentient being um, temporary and ultimate happiness they desire and need. And Geshe Dogger, in one of his um, talking about happiness, something happiness, inner happiness, um, he says, You make your the wish granting tool you're transforming into is the Dharma. So mm. you visualize giving your, the body of Dharma. Yeah. So Chuggy is saying that Geshe Doga said that you think that you transform your body into a wish fulfilling jewel, which is the Dhamma. So you give the Dhamma to, to others. So I think that uh, there are so many different ways that we can think of practicing giving and all those different advice that we get from or teachings that we get from other teaching, teachers can be, can increase our ability and visualization in giving it away to others. I think that in the seven point mind training, it is done in a nice way. It is, first of all, explaining how to do it in general. This is the section that I just started to read from. Then it starts with, then it, the next section is giving to those not engaged in the spiritual path, which means give it to those who are not Dharma practitioners. I'll look at that in a second. Then next section is given in particular to those who harm us. Then offering to those who are engaged in the spiritual path, those that are Buddhist, then giving to the environment in which sentient beings live in. So you think of transforming your body um, into so many different ways, um, and it fulfills the purpose of you know, non-Buddhist, Buddhist, those who harm you. And you can also in, then take that presentation and look at what Shantideva says here in his text. So for example, he speaks of the way to give them away, the reason it is um, reasonable to give them away in a definite manner. Um, then how discarding, actually let's look at those verses up until um, verse 16. Sorry. So also my body possessions and all virtues in the three times I will give away without regret to achieve the purpose of sentient beings. Giving everything, one goes to Nirvana. My man achieves Nirvana. To surrender everything at once is the supreme offerings to sentient beings. Then, in looking at how to practice, from today on, give up the idea of having freedom over my body. So we have decided to give it away to others. So since I have offered this body to all sentient beings to do, to do with it as they please, they can always kill it, criticize it, or beat it, whatever pleases them. Whatever, whether they use it for play, amusement, or ridicule it, since I have already offered it, why should it concern me? I sh shall allow them any action that does not harm them. So that's what Shantideva says here. And I wanted to link it up with, the, with mind training like the rays of the sun. So 
let's see where it is. It's here. So let's look at a section of, for example, giving away to those who harm you. Giving in, partic in particular to those who harm us. Having imagined creating various external necessities such as food, clothing, and shelter from our bodies, we invoke all harmful elements with the hook of the awakening mind. So we think of all of those who harm us. We hook them with the mind of enlightenment then sincerely give them whatever they require. Generate a deep sense of closeness to them, thinking you've all been my, my own mother on countless occasions over beginning this time. You have tried your utmost to help me in every possible way, saving me from misery and disaster. Remember that in addition, we owe them an immense debt, having eaten the flesh, gnawed the bones, drunk the blood and worn their skins. We have robbed them of their possessions, tortured them physically and taken their lives. We should recognize that we now have a responsibility to repay this debt of kindness. So this is an extension of what Shantideva says, right? So we've given away our body to others. So if they ridicule us, if they beat us, if they criticize us, if they do things that we would normally react to with anger, we need to think about them as they've been our mothers before or that and or that we've robbed them, killed them, eaten the flesh, drank the blood, wore the skins, robbed the possessions. Since this is the right, imagine they're obtaining what they each wish in their respective form. Food for the hungry, clothes for the needy, shelter for the homeless, friends and servants for those who yearn for them. Of the food supply, three dairy products, the three sweets and flesh and blood for those who want them. Give liberally without restraint. Let those who want to want flesh eat it. Let those who want blood drink it. Let those who want bones know it. Let those who want skins wear them. Whether they want raw food immediately or cooked food eventually, let them have it. The moment we give them, we give to them. They eat. The bellies fill, and being relieved of hunger, thirst, and poverty, they gain material satisfaction. The malicious thoughts and evil deeds are pacified. So all those things we visualize. The altruistic intent of the awakening mind is born in their mind streams and the two collections are perfected. Imagine that thereby the mind streams are imbued with the bliss and, um, of the perfect body of truth, the Dhammakaya. The two collections The collection of merit and the collection of the wisdom. Of the yeah. So, going back to. Yeah. So, then asp aspiring for virtue to become a cause that does not go to waste. So, aspiring for virtue to act solely as a cause for the benefit of others, to act as a cause preventing such thoughts from going to waste and preventing actions from going to waste. Let's look at that briefly. Um, may look into me never be meaningless. Whether it is a mind of anger or faith arises directed at me, may it become the cause for all their purposes to continue to be continuously fulfilled. May whoever affronts me, harms me otherwise, so backstabs me, have the fortune of enlightenment, right? So this is in line with what we were just read through in, um, in mind training, like the rays of the sun. Yeah. There you have it. And then dedicated it to be a cause of enjoyment. So we read through those verses also. May, become, may I become a protector for the unprotected, a guide for those traveling along the path, a sheep, a ferry, or a bridge for those that want to cross and so forth. I think that we know those verses. We've had them before. So I just want to go back quickly, briefly, to um, mind training like the rays of the sun and look at the previous section, which again explains the way that you give away your body, how you think about it. So we should first give our bodies to 
the beings in the eight hot hells, such as the reviving hell, then to the beings in the eight cold hells, such as the blistering hell. Then we should give to beings in the surrounding hells and to beings in the occasional hells where suffering are felt intermittently. To these beings, we should give whatever we can, transforming everything just as an alchemical elixir changes iron into gold. We should imagine those beings attain lives with freedom and opportunity to practice the doctrine, the Dharma. We should think that they are enriched with the seven jewels of exalted beings, as well as the seven good qualities of high status. Just as a precious wish-fulfilling jewel provides whatever we desire, such as food and clothing, so we should imagine that in giving away our bodies, they grant all wishes, manifest as food imbued with 100 flavors, clothing to the value of a thousand gold coins, mansions with 500 flaws, and excellent companions who act only as an inspiration, who are associated with enjoyments, who delight in whatever objects are to be enjoyed, and who surrounded by the possessions are replete with everything. They are also to be imagined as being favorable factors for the accomplishment of every highest teachings of the great vehicle. So I think that this is where we can link up that point that um, Chucky um, came up with what Geshe Doga said. You know, so Geshe Doga said that you can think about it as giving away your body, becoming a wish from feeling jewel, the giving away the Dharma to others. So you can think about it as you know, if you give it away to those are at need, then first of all, you provide them with those, your body becomes whatever they need immediately. And then they meet with all the freedoms and opportunities so that they can also meet the Dharma. So you give them the Dharma. In um, the Lam Ring outlines as well, um, it's an extensive presentation on, um, on the giving, giving and taking, and mm. it um, goes through each of the realms and descriptions of the giving and giving out of the electric. So that's in the Lam Ring channel? Uh, no, no, Lam Ring outlines. Lam Ring outlines, so okay. It goes through one. Oh, of yeah, the so that's from Pabon, based on Pabonkari's yeah. presentation. Yeah. Cool. All right. I had a couple of more points to make, but maybe we'll make them tomorrow. It's a lot. Sorry? Uh, I think that that's from the previous. Yeah. All right. So maybe let's stop here for now. Yeah. Any Karen or Karen Wobble? Okay. All right, all right, sorry. So I spoke about a different current. Rimboche, Maki Panaki Guchi, Kevanyan Palme Paya, Gone Gondu Pawasho, Kandira Wake Wash in Kandi, and Dante Wan Illusion Lane, Chandresi Wan Dizimbia Soi, Shapesi Te Padu and Guchi, Dosun Jachi and Jango, Tezi Yonawe, Gonzo Do. Cho song ko we me mon tu tu a anda so do che ko do sha Thank you people Thank you thank you very much Ta -ta. Thank you